Hallelujah. 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 How excellent is your name in all the earth. Hallelujah. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. Amen. He's been better to us than we've been to ourselves. It's because of the Lord that we're not consumed. Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tonight we'll continue talking about the kingdom currency of faith, part 19. We've been stuck for the last couple of weeks talking about the six hindrances to faith. I didn't know it would take so long to get through six uh, hindrances of faith. We said that the first hindrance is the lack of understanding of the new creation. The second one is the lack of understanding of our place in him. The third one is the lack of understanding of our righteousness. And then the fourth one was the lack of understanding of the privilege or our privilege to use the name of Jesus. Not only the uh, exousia, but the dunamis, right? And then we said that the fifth thing was the lack of understanding about acting on the word of God. Lack of understanding about acting on the word of God. Let's go to the last one, number six, Hebrews 4 and 14. I'm going to read this from the ESV, and then uh, after this we'll be in the CBS translation. Are you there? Hebrews 4, 14. Since then we have a great high priest. How many know he's a great high priest? Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. And so the last um, hindrance to our faith is lack of understanding that we are to hold fast to our confession of faith. We are to hold fast to our confession of faith. A lot of people start out um, making the right confessions saying the right thing, but then when they don't see manifestation, they start getting in agreement with what they see. And so it's a hindrance to your faith when you don't hold fast to the confession of faith. How many know we got to keep speaking the word even when we don't seemingly see anything? When it doesn't even look like it's a cloud in the sky, we got to continue to speak the word of God. And so that is the sixth hindrance to our faith. Now, let's talk about this next point, faith in action. Say faith, faith. In, action. in action. Now, it's only one, one part to this faith in action. It's not a bunch of scriptures. It's, it's one chapter and a few scriptures where we're probably going to end up getting stuck here because the Lord gave me a revelation of this particular verses of scripture today. And so we're going to probably end up getting stuck. So just go to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to start at the first verse. And we're reading from the Christian Standard Bible. The CBS Christian, I think it's CSB, Christian Standard Bible. <laughs> it's, it's Christian something. Christian Standard Bible, I believe. Verse number one, are you there? The sons of the prophet said to Elisha, please notice that the place where we live under your supervision is too small for us. Who said this? Sons of the prophet. What was their complaint? Place was too small, okay. Please let us go to the Jordan where we can each get a log and can build ourselves a place to live there. He said, go, go ahead. He said, go, he said. Then one said, please come with your servants. I'll come, he answered. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. Say they cut down trees. As one of them 
was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, oh my master, it was borrowed. He was immediately in debt. Then the man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, the man of God cut a piece of wood, threw it in there, and made the iron float. Then he said, pick it up. So he reached out and took it. Now, the Lord told me to read this with a deeper understanding. He said, read this. I want to show you some things that is within this text that you may not have ever paid attention to. And so I want to give you nine things that happened in this particular story. Nine things that happened in this story. The first thing, they acknowledge that there was a need for growth. They acknowledge that there was a need for growth. This is um, where everybody needs to be. Nobody has arrived. And so we must acknowledge that there is a need for growth. If you think you are through growing, then you are through. Everybody has room to grow, room uh, for improvement. You never arrive. And so even though this was one particular set of the schools of the prophets, because there were many schools uh, of the prophets, they had different sects. They were used in groups of 50. And so these particular prophets, this school, acknowledge that there's, there's a need for us to grow. We've outgrown this place where we've been meeting. And faith is for a fight. So you have to acknowledge that I've outgrown where I am. You know, when it seems like nothing is really working and when frustration set in, it means that you've outgrown that place. Frustration is always an indicator that something has to change. And so the prophet said, we've outgrown this place. We are aware that this isn't working anymore. And every one of us in here, you need to come to a place in your life when you are aware and you acknowledge this is not working anymore. Something has to shift. Something needs to change in order for me to move forward. Because some people are okay mastering the same thing. They're okay mastering the same thing. They don't push themselves uh, to grow. They don't stretch themselves. Some people just comfortable doing what they do. And if you challenge them to do better, to do more, they, some of them get offended. Because this has always worked. Let me say this. Just because something has always worked doesn't mean that's the end of it. People are like, well, this works all the time. Of course it does. You mastered it. But if you want to grow, you got to put yourself in a different position where you can be stretched. A muscle is stretched. Um, the way that muscles develop is that literally they're damaged. In the process of, of working out and, and that resistance that comes against you, muscles are damaged. And when they begin to repair themselves, they get bigger. They get stronger. But they would never get bigger and stronger if they were never stretched. What stretches them? Resistance. Pressure. And you don't stay at the same five pounds. You go up. Because five pounds, would not even, it would not even provide any more resistance. So you have to go up. You have to sometimes change things up because your body can become immune to a certain thing, to a certain workout. You have to do something totally different. And so that's how it is in the spirit. Some people are just comfortable doing what they do. And then they always say, I want more, and I want to grow, and I want to develop, but they never move. And this is a prophet saying, listen, we've outgrown this spot. I don't know how many people could fit in this place but they acknowledge that there was a need for growth. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you acknowledged that there is a need for growth in your life? This is, this is necessary for everybody. But let me say this, especially for leadership. Any leader that refuses to put themselves in an environment or a situation that causes them to grow, you're a sorry leader. Any leader that does not read, you're not a good leader. Good leaders read. And, and if you're going to lead people, you have to be stretched. 
Because as a leader, it is your responsibility to stretch people. So if you're not being stretched first, how are you going to stretch others when you are always in that same place, that, that small place? The second thing, they knew that expansion would require them leaving their current location. They knew that expansion would require them to leave their current location. Some people don't want expansion because they're comfortable in their location. Why? Because we're creatures of habit, habit, and we're comfortable doing the same thing because at least we know what these results will be. And so they realized that in order to grow, or another word, in order to maximize what was on their lives and in their lives, they had to be willing to relocate. Now, their relocation was physical. Sometimes it is physical. But more so spiritual than physical, because if you keep moving physically and never move spiritually, you're still in the same predicament. And so they had to uh, know that expansion would require them leaving the the current uh, the current place current location now sometime when you leave your current place you leave people behind because some people refuse to grow and if you refuse to grow you can't go our problem is we're trying to carry people with us that will not grow. And they end up being a hindrance to you and slowing down your progress because you keep playing the rescuer. So if you refuse to grow, you can't go. But if you're gonna gonna expand, then you gotta realize that it's gonna require leaving my current location. This is what happened when the Lord challenged us to leave Charlotte. You got to leave your current location if you want to experience growth. Now, we could have stayed in that little tight space and been full, and we could have been lying like the other preachers. Doc, we running over. Well, you don't hold but seven. Of course you're running over. We could have been comfortable saying, we packing it, Doc. One one of the problems, because there is is a numeric uh, equation for ministry. And the numeric equation says when you reach, some people have different numbers, but basically when you reach 70% capacity of the space that you're in, it's time to either shift or go to multiple services. So let's just take a simple equation. If you can seat 100 people and you got 70 people showing up consistently every week, the equations say that it's time to shift to another service because you never want to max out where you are. You always want to have room for increase and expansion. Well, that presents a challenge to some people because some people are just comfortable seeing most of the seats filled. You know, some people won't move because they're celebrating where they are. So if you're going to experience this growth, you got to be willing to move from your current location. First and foremost in the spirit. Your spirit should always be progressing even if your body not really physically moving. You should be moving. So the second point Holy Spirit said is they knew that expansion would require them leaving their current current location. Listen, everything, the promises of God are what? Yes Yes and what? Okay, the Bible says that eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. One translation said prepare has prepared and keep waiting or ready for them that love it. So it's in the sense that there are some things already prepared. But your eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, hasn't entered into your heart. So if there are some things that are already prepared for us, then those prepared things are in a location. And the location is in the place where God has ordained for me to be. And so if I continue to stay stuck where I am, and never move, 
and be willing to relocate, then I'll never experience the things that God has prepared for me and that he keeps ready for me. And so a lot of people forfeit their destiny and their purpose because they will not move out of that place of being comfortable. You got to be willing to move. Stop being afraid to move. Moving stretches you. Moving stretches you. You know, after, after my grandmother passed, my mom got to the place where she didn't want to leave the house. She went from driving, coming to church, doing everything for herself, to sitting in the house almost like a recluse. And it got to the point from her sitting in the house, Sister Kim, so I had to go up the three flights of stairs, carry her downstairs, put her in the car, take her to her doctor appointments, get back to the apartments, pick her up, carry her up, her up three flights of stairs. Well, how do you go from fully driving and functional to now you can't even walk? You didn't move. God created us to move. He didn't create us to just sit in one place and not move. Your body needs to move. And so if you're going to understand this concept, it's going to take you relocating. Why are you sticking on that? Because you're stubborn. Because you think you know everything. And you don't. Yeah, you do know everything on your street. You're the smartest person on your street. That's why you won't venture out the neighborhood. You know, if you're the smartest person in your group, you need to get a new group. But see, the problem is we have an issue with people and situations that stretches us because we want to feel like we're the master. And as long as you're the master, you can't grow. And so we hang around people that need us. Because people that need you will always tell you what you want to hear. They will always comply. Okay. They will always comply with what you want. But you need some people that will tell you the truth. And stretch you. You need to stop taking pride. I'm the smartest one in my, in my circle. That's, that, that's the problem. For a couple of reasons, and I ain't going to go there. That's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. Because you ain't all that. That's a problem. And, and there, there's, there's nobody to stretch you. That means that you can't grow. I'm the richest person in my circle. I got more money. That's a problem. That's a problem. Because you need to experience wealth on a different level. You need to learn the difference between being rich and being wealthy. There's a difference. But you're so impressed by yourself and with yourself that you won't move. I always tell y'all, you need two kinds of relationships. You need relationships that's, that's under you, those that you're pouring into, and that's pushing you out the way so they can get up. And then you need relationships above you that's pulling you to the next level. We're challenged by relationships that pull us because being pulled is uncomfortable. Being challenged is uncomfortable. When you start hanging around doctors and attorneys and different things, it's uncomfortable because you're used to being the one in charge of everything. See, the, the, the pastor with the 500 members, oh, he got people coming to him. But when he get around, a person got 10,000 members. It's uncomfortable. Because you realize that you just started high school again. You're a freshman. See, when, listen, when I was in, it wasn't middle school then. It was junior high school. It was 7th, 8th, and ninth. It wasn't no 6th graders. 7th, 8th, and ninth. So when we got to the ninth grade, Deacon Care, we was it. We ran the school. When they seen us, they stepped aside. Get to the side, you little 7th grader. We, we was it. Then the first day of high school, many that was it in junior high got thrown in bushes in high school. 
Why? You starting over again. You're not it. You're around people stronger than you, smarter than you, got more experience than you. And so you got to realize that when you get to different levels, there are people with more experience. And it might be intimidating, but it's necessary because that is the only environment that can stretch you. I can't stay there. Because, listen, if you keep, what they say insanity is what? Same thing over and over and expecting different results. There, there are some people that's operating in insanity. They expect, listen, they in insanity with their finances because they haven't learned lessons. They still spending everything, not saving, not using wisdom. That's insanity because they believe in money going to fall out of heaven. That's insanity. They're insanity with their health, binding calories and Insanity, doing the same thing and thinking it's a different outcome. It's not. Some stuff is not even spiritual, it's just common sense. But we know that it's not that common anymore, right? Okay, let, let me get off of that one. That was, num- that was the second thing. Number three, they knew this would require each student participating in the process. They knew this would require each student participating in the process. It says that each one of them cut down a tree. That means that we didn't sit on the side and watch them do the work. That means in order to build this bigger place, to facilitate what we're trying to facilitate, it's going to take everybody working, everybody doing their part, not sitting on the sideline. You know, one of the things that really upsets me, which I don't have no control about it, that the team that goes to the Super Bowl even the person that never touched the field get a ring. They suit just as clean. They can go hang it back up in the locker. They never made a play, but they get a ring by association. Same thing with the World Series. I mean, it doesn't matter. Same thing with basketball. They get a ring. They ain't even get out there and bounce the ball one time. But they get a ring because of connection. But they understood that if we're going to build this this place of expansion, everybody got to cut down a a log. Everybody got to work. And what what is frustrating many times is that you see people that have the ability to do certain things, and they're too lazy to do it. They will not work. Uh, They won't do anything. They just sit and smile, and they say, oh, yes, our ministry. Oh, yes, what we're doing. But the truth of the matter is you're not doing a whole lot. How much more could be done if everybody would do something? Uh, I know y'all not going to like me tonight, but I didn't come for friends. The Bible says each man cut down a, a log. One translation says a log. So they was building a log house. But everybody was working. God did not call for there to just be two or three people in any given church or five or 10 or 20, whatever the number is. I've even heard from pastors that have what we call mega churches that it's still only 10% of the people doing the work. So if you got 5,000 people, only 500 people working, that means 4,500 people not doing anything. So we'll look at a a big church that, man, they probably got plenty of help. No, the concept is the same. So they knew this would require each student participating in the process. Now, I don't want you to haul out loud. I don't want you to raise your hand. I just want you to think. Are you participating in the process? Don't say nothing. Just, just internalize it. Are you participating in the process? Or are you just sitting on the sideline? Because you wanted them people. I told you there's three kinds of people. There are people that make stuff happen, people that watch stuff happen, and people that wake up and say, when did it happen? Which one are you? Are you contributing to the building of the expansion? What God is trying to build? Because what happens is people will be in there, oh, yes, Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then God send new people. And the new people are hungry. They're committed. They're ready. And then they start doing stuff. And then you start rolling your eyes. Who they think they is? They're your replacement. That's who they are. 
because you refuse to grab a log and help build. God said, I'll send some workers. They're your replacement. That's who they are. You can't get mad at nobody but yourself because you done had 50 years to do something. You've been sitting in that pew for 50 years and have become territorial. This is my pew. Well, okay, you stay right there. Well, we get ready to build. So it didn't say one prophet say they all cut down a log and begin to build. Listen, I know I say this and this is my passion because I know how God groomed me before I was um, a pastor. I, I watch people that got a call, but they never called to serve. I watch people. I'm called. I need to do this. But I never seen you vacuum. I never seen you grab a rag out of the women's hand and go say, I got the bathroom today. I can't get that. I, I, I never seen you serve in any capacity. The only thing I ever heard you say is I'm called. Your calling is to serve. When people say I'm called, they mean give me pulpit time. No, you're called to serve. Your first ministry is not TBN, it's TBM. Toilet bowl ministry. That's beneath me. We're preaching this beneath you. Because Jesus took a towel. He girded himself. He washed dirty, nasty, stinky feet that had walked through dung and dirt and dust. And he took the towel and he began to wash their feet to show them that it's about serving. And Peter said, you'll never wash my feet, Lord. He said, well, I don't have no part of you then. Then Peter said, wash my head. He said, no, everything, no need wash. You already had a bath, I assume, but your feet dusty. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but I'm being honest. Every one of them grabbed a the log. They say, we building this. Some people don't want to build. They just want to show up. Look what we did. Well, I looked at the list. You didn't have a log. All these people brought logs. You want a ministry. Ministry is servant. That's what the word minister means is servant, a bond servant. The apostles say we're bond servants. The, 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 the picture of, of the apostles being bond servants is the lower part of a ship where the, the lower hands were rowing, moving the ship. The workers in the lower part. That's what a bond servant is. You have to have the ability to serve to keep things moving. I love my church. What you doing in there? What you doing in there? Sister Jennifer, I can't get no help. I'm out here by myself tonight. I love my word life off the chain. What are you doing in word life? You inviting people to church. Oh, what? What you serving your church? No, girl, but we on fire. Huh? What? What are you doing? Are you building? Are you rowing? I am an intercessor. I don't do. Your prayers ain't going past. I ain't even gonna give you the ceiling. They ain't going past your throat. Because the greatest in the kingdom is not an intercessor. The greatest is a servant. I can't get help. I, I know the women, they do what they do because both sets of women, we got two groups that clean up. But there was a situation that happened last week and they brought it to my attention and I was like, how y'all do it? How y'all clean it up? How y'all do it? They were like, we used to it, apostle. I say, I love y'all ladies. I love you. I say, I'm taking y'all out to eat Sunday after church. I say, because ain't no way in the world I could have did what y'all went in there and did. See, that behind the scenes stuff. See, you just go sit your hips down on a clean toilet. But you don't know how that toilet looked before you got in there. Somebody had the minister in there. Well, when you come into word life, it's not even a little piece of paper on the carpet. It's just so immaculate. 
Well, the angels wasn't in him vacuuming last night. Let's see how quiet this is. Somebody doing this. Let me get somebody to say, go to your next point, Apostle. I'm, I'm a... No, no, because you, you need to know what real ministry is. You know, if, if I had to be out there cleaning the bathroom, cleaning, we've done all that. We believe me, we've done that for years. So don't have a problem with it. My wife still be fighting over the rag. I do it. They have to run her out the building. <laughs> Sister Terry be like, if you don't get out of here, Pastor yeah. Michelle. Because we, we understand serving. Yeah. But as you grow, you can't do everything. You can't. Listen, the, the more a ministry grows, pastors that's listening to me get this point. You can't touch everything. You can't touch. I used to run the sound. We used to clean up. I, I, used, to do, I used to know I'd do everything. I trained everybody in here doing something. I trained them. I don't even know how to do that sound no more. I know how the basics, but all this stuff with TV, I don't know how to do all that stuff now. God gave me a team. Yes. You, you can't touch everything. Many hands make light work. They downstairs set up an editing room. They editing the video for TV. I don't know how to do all that stuff. We was on the VHSs last time I was messing with the camera. And then when they got the little ones that you could put in, I thought we were doing something. We got the little tapes. And then we were on cassettes. And now, then we got CD. Now we got MP3. God, no, I told, I said, God, no, we needed the help. What is that? That's bringing that log. You ain't here. Put that log right there. Next point. Number four, right? Some of you ain't going to like this. They understood the importance of including the leader. You got it, Brother Terrence? They ain't go behind the leader back. We finna have this secret Bible study over here called a prophetic encounter. No, they, they understood the importance of including the leader. Even after he gave them permission to build, they said, go with us. Because they know in order to effectively build something, we got to have the anointing present. Yeah. We got secret service saints that's going around doing little stuff on the side. And don't think that the men and women of God know. Ah. Just doing stuff. Building. Try, thank you, building something. I don't even sweat stuff no more. I am so carefree. I checked my blood pressure yesterday. Wasn't it yesterday, sweetie? My blood pressure was the lowest it's done been in 88 years. <laughs> Y'all saw, you ain't even been, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm saying it's the low, I can't even remember being that low for at least for 30, 20 something years. <laughs> See, why your blood? Because see, I, I work out, first of all. I work out, right? And I'm stress-free. My resting heart rate is 50-something. I am stress-free. Stuff that I used to worry about, God got it. I ain't got to be having no little micro, no, um, no binoculars trying to see what people are doing. God got it. They understood the importance of incorporating the leader. Even though he knew what they were doing. He said, Bill, go ahead. They say, will you please go with us? Now, this, these prophets were smart. We're going to talk about why they were so smart. But they understood, man, we need to not only get his permission, we need to get him involved. We can't be sneaking building nothing. Talking about it's for the kingdom, and we didn't run it by the kingdom representative. Holy Ghost gave me this today. I could stay right there. Because, you know, I've been, I've been around for a while, y'all. And I've seen people in churches, they having little secret Bible studies behind the pastor back. And what they're really doing is building a ministry. Listen, because you know now, 
Brother Wright, they got these little home groups, life groups, where they have like a person got all these people and they meet together. So it's, they like, it's like a little Bible study, but you really, they pastor. Let me ask you a question. Now, now we can call it what we want to call it. And if that's what y'all are doing, watching me, that, praise the Lord, it works for you. But I've seen too many, too many clicks and too, heard too many horror stories about that. I heard mega pastors say they don't do it. They tried it and they split their church. Because, Sister Potts, if I, if I got, got you and 10 other people every week, and I'm pouring into you, teaching you, but you can't get to the pastor, I'm your pastor. I may not call myself. The pastor may not call me. I'm the pastor. And so you thinking, well, why do we need the pastor then? If we got somebody with us every week. And he thinking, if I'm teaching the people, why he getting the credit? Why I don't just start my own thing? So, so splits happen in secrecy. I ain't, I ain't get no help. And you now, you know the pastor said we give them a curriculum. Okay, but what if that, that, that leader, this is calling that lead, Minister in that situation. What if they get their own revelation? You're not there to check it. So what if they start teaching something that's not quite in alignment with what you said? Okay, I got to get off of that. I'm going to get off of it. So they understood the importance of including the leader, right? The fifth thing. They went to Jordan. Jordan represents vision. It was in Jordan when, when Jesus was baptized. When Elisha was going through his test, the different cities, he was at Jordan. Jordan is the place of vision. So, number five, they knew that it took vision to build. Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. I say it again. Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see are rare. Everybody looking, but everybody not seeing. And it was interesting that the prophets wanted to go to Jordan. They were literally saying, we cannot build without vision. Who got that? We cannot build without vision. Because if you try to build without vision, you're going to build something out of your emotions or out of your own intellect. It takes vision to build. And they realized that we want to build this school right at the place of vision. Because this is a school of prophets. How can prophets see without vision? So how do we make this applicable for our life? If you're going to build anything, you got to first have a vision. you got to see past your nose. And I'm not talking about... When, when I pray, God anoint my eyes to see beyond the veil of the flesh. Because there is a veil that is in front of us. It is the veil of the flesh. What is the veil of the flesh? The veil of the flesh is everything we see with our natural eyes. Everything. It's a veil. Because we know the spirit realm is more real than the natural realm. So, so when I say God anoint my eyes to see beyond the veil of the flesh, I want to penetrate the flesh and look into the spirit realm so I can see what heaven is doing. And not only what heaven is doing, what heaven wants me to do. Yeah. What heaven wants me to build. Yeah. Because, you it, listen, if you build it in the flesh, it has to be maintained and supported by the flesh. Right. Whatever realm you get, get your vision from, that's the realm that finances it. So if I get, my, if I get my, my stuff out of the natural realm, then I am responsible for paying for it. But if I, if I build at the place of vision, and I do like Moses, if I build it according to the pattern, then heaven has the resources to finance what I'm building. 
The problem is too many people get revelations out of their flesh. And then they want heaven to finance it. And God is saying, build at the place of vision. Because if I gave it to you and I showed it to you, I'll finance it. I'll finance there. See, there are already resources for his vision. We have to get in alignment with his vision. And his vision always has provision from day one. When Jesus was born, the wise men showed up with provision. Why did they show up with provision? Because he has a vision. Gold and silver, frankincense and myrrh. Evidently, they set Jesus up. Because he, he was able to take 12 men off their jobs and support them and their families and give to the poor. Evidently, they set him up. They didn't just set him up for the short term. They, sh- they set him up till he left here. Because if God gives the vision, he sends provision. One of the ways that you, you will know that you're in, in the will of God is when provision, matter of fact, provision will beat you. It'll beat you there. You'll go there and be like, man, God did this. Wow. I was getting, God, you already did. You already see you, you, you need it. You need it. So you got to make sure you're, you're building at the place of vision. So there'll be provision. See, you don't just need money. You need resources of people. You need favor. You need the right doors. You, you need more than money. You need the right people. Because if you got the, the money right and the people wrong, you're still not going to make it. So God will have people waiting on you to help you. Oh, I know some. I do that. I do that. Yeah, I got this. I don't worry about that. Say the place of vision. Ah, man. Okay. Number six. They were cutting down trees, putting in the work. They were putting in the work. This is beautiful. Why? Because they were prophets but they were not afraid to get splinters in their hands. I'm going to come on this side of the room. They were prophets, but they were not afraid to get splinters in their hands. They were putting in the work. You got to put in the work to see the result of your faith. Everything I'm teaching you out of this particular, it's about faith. You got to be willing to put the work in. The log not going to show up. You got to cut it. They were cutting down the logs. They were putting in the work. See, we got people calling themselves prophets today. They, they can't do nothing but prophesy. They can't work in children's church. They can't clean the bathroom. They can't vacuum. These hands are for pointing and saying, thus saith the Lord. We, we got people called, but they don't want to cut no trees down. You know, I was looking, you know, they took, they took my show off the air a year, a year or so ago, Hawaii Five-O. And um, so, so McGarrett, aunt, which ironically was Carol Burnett, came to town. And she had her little fiancé with her who she was going to marry. They just had known each other a few months. But both of them had cancer, so they wanted to be happy as they died. And so he, she told McGarrett that he was um, a builder. He was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. And so when McGarrett met him and shook his hand, you know, he didn't say nothing. He's like, okay. So when he got back to the office, he's like, something not right. Say, so if he's a builder, why he don't even have calluses on his hands? 
It's like his hands don't measure up with his occupation. See, I get a revelation in everything. You, you're saying you build stuff, but your hands move. Okay. You're saying you're a prophet, but your hands move. You hadn't put any work in. You're not helping to build anything. These prophets was out here working. They didn't have a chainsaw. They had an axe. Passing it along, cutting a tree, getting that stuff to bring it to add, to contribute to what we're building. They were putting the work in. I don't care if you're an apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor, singer, dancer, player, sound man, videographer, parking lot attendant. Everybody got to put some work in. Everybody got to put some work in. You never outgrow work. You never outgrow it. I, this, this, this modern day church, something wrong. Yeah. Something is wrong. It, it is off. Because you got everybody wanting to be important. Nobody want to serve. If everybody got armor bearers, who going to work? If everybody in the church is a pastor and the minister, and they don't think they're supposed to do nothing but preach. Who going to work? Who going to bring logs? Who going to get some calluses and some splinters in their hand? I look at, I look at some of these preachers and men's of them, but their hands look like women's hands. They, they got their nails manicured and painted, and they stuff just as soft as a, I say they ain't doing nothing. <laughs> I said, I ain't doing much. Hand prettier than his wife. <laughs> Baby, she the one working. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm like, okay. Who bringing logs, y'all? Who's contributing to the building of the kingdom while we looking important? And you know people say, well, I love the Lord. Really? Really? Well, you can't question my love. I look at your love. Well, let's just go to the scripture. It don't matter what I think, right? Let's just go to the scripture. The Bible says that a man that don't take care of his own household is worse than an infidel. An infidel is an unsaved person. So if you don't take care of your house, you're worse than an unsaved person. But that scripture has dual reference. It just don't mean your house where you sleep. It means God's house too. So a person that does not take care of God's house is worse than an unsaved person. So how can you say you love God when you're not bringing any logs? Well, I'm working on me. Well, won't you surrender so you can be meek for the master's use. And every time God needs you, he don't have to see you over there in the bleachers because you won't get your monkey self together. He called him a monkey. I ain't called nobody name. I, I ain't called nobody name. Sometimes monkeys got more sense. I saw the day where a man was in a snake-infested lake. Infested. And you know who reached their hand out to help him? A orangutan. Pull him up out the snake-infested lake. Saved his life. Sometimes the animal kingdom got more sense than us. I say, Wow. Wow, the monkey, the orangutan saved a man's life. That was that was deep to me. Y'all don't see y'all don't see stuff and stuff, right? Y'all don't see stuff. 
Like I had a dream last night that I had to walk because they had all the roads blocked off. And that has meaning to the adversary trying to stop your progression. But, and I was walking down the street and there was pit bulls everywhere. They, it was everywhere. And one pit bull was jumping over the fence to come and get me and a lion ran up. And I said, now I got to fight a lion and a pit bull. And the lion grabbed a pit bull by the throat, shook his head and ran off with him. I said, okay, God, you got my back. And when the lion showed up, a sword appeared in my hand. And so I was, well, Peter might be listening. I was taking care of business left and right. <laughs> um, so when, it, when the smoke cleared, I was standing. But see, a lion, I'm afraid. It's, no, it's how you perceive it. Is it the lion of the tribe of Judah? Okay, I got it. I got 10 minutes. Lord, help me. So they were putting in the work, right? Okay, so number seven. The Bible says that as he was cutting down a tree, he, his axe head fell off and fell in the water, right? And he told Elisha that it had fell in there. So number seven, they were honest when they lost their tool, they didn't fake it. When they, when they lost their tool, they didn't fake it. They said, leader, I done messed up. I don't have what I used to have. They didn't try to keep faking it. They were honest. We got people want to hide. They, they won't say, listen, I don't, my axe done got dull. It's done lost its edge. I'm swinging that stuff, but it ain't even cut no more because I allowed myself to get dull. They were honest. They say, listen, we were working, but we lost our ability to work. Because it fell off. They were honest. See, you can help an honest person. But when people over there playing like they swinging and they ain't even got no axe no more. You'd be like, oh, they working. No, they ain't working. They faking. They done lost the tool. They done lost their consecration. They done lost their prayer life. They done lost their desire for the word of God. They done lost their desire for God's house. They going through the motion. They look like they working, but it ain't nothing there. You got to work harder with a dull axe. So they said, Master, I lost it. It was borrowed. I borrowed this to build something for God. Now I'm in debt. Say, be honest. honest. Number eight. They understood that the leader had an anointing for recovery. I feel like kicking this offering bucket over. I can kick it. You say, come on, pastor. Oh, okay. (laughs) Don't tell me to come on. I'll flip it and buy another one. Listen, they understood that their leader had an anointing for recovery. See, when you hiding stuff, you ain't doing nothing but hurting yourself. I'm going to figure this out, how that's working for you. How do you know that, apostle? Why would he even come and tell his leader that he lost something? if the leader didn't have an anointing for him to recover. Now I want to get into what I was saying earlier. Why was the leader invited? Because we need his anointing for any mistakes we might make. Anything we may lose in the process, he has an anointing for recovery. I'm going to do this by myself. I don't need no leader to help. Go ahead. How that's working for you? Go ahead. Swing your little dull axe that you done got from the dollar store. Swing it. With a true anointing, there is an anointing for recovery. What you lose in an attempt to please and obey God can be recovered. (laughs) 
Now, I ain't talking about what you out there foolish with. I'm talking about what you lose in an attempt to obey God and be recovered. They, he borrowed this to build something for God. It can be recovered because the motor was right. You never lose when you're building for God. Say never. Because the enemy will play games with you. You shouldn't have gave that big offering. You See, look at you now. See, if you entertain that, you're going to forfeit your reward. If you let that devil play with your mind and make you think that giving to God is lost, you're going to forfeit everything that was attached to that obedience. Because any attempt to obey God, even if you missed it, and it was an attempt to obey God. Yeah. There's an anointing for recovery. Yeah. Amen. Number nine. They reached out to receive what was once lost. <laughs> oh, God. Did anybody catch that? That he reached out. To receive, the, the, the leader said, you pick it up. My anointing brought it close enough for you to regain it. My anointing put it within reach, but I'm not picking it up for you. You reach down and get it yourself. So the prophet reached out and receive what was once lost. This whole process, because Elisha cut a piece of tree down and threw it in the water. Now, I submit this to you. Scripture doesn't tell us, but common sense tells us. Anybody ever been fishing? There are some water you can see the fish. It's shallow water. Usually the little fish in the shallow water. You're going to be right there all day getting your worm ate. The little fish going to hit it and go, right? But the big fish in the deep. I submit to you that wherever this axe landed, the natural man could not walk into it. It was not a shallow place where the prophet could just walk right there and pick it up. It had to be recovered supernaturally. Now, I've been fishing, and I've seen some lures and stuff in the water where I could take my socks and stuff and pull my pants and walk out there and pick it up. But this, you couldn't do that with this axe. It was deep. And so when Elisha threw the, the stick in the water, the stick attached to the axe head and brought it up. And it be, see, y'all, the axe head began to swim back to the prophet. And the prophet just had to pick it up. It wasn't just throw a stick out there and then the axe head floated by itself. No, the stick, the anointing attached to the lost thing. And recovered it and brought it back up so it can be within reach. We don't just need the anointing to show up. We need it to capture what we thought was lost and bring it back while we can grab hold of it and say, now we can continue to build. Do you see that? Say the anointing for recovery. I I want you to get this tonight. The Holy Spirit showed me this. He said you need to write, you need to type this stuff out. And teach this just like I'm giving it to you. Because it's a powerful revelation in these couple of verses. That if you're just reading your Bible, you're not going to get it. Holy Spirit has to, he has to apocalypse us. He has to uncover it. And I'm telling you that if you get busy for God, if you start showing up with your Lord, but you got to move from where you are. You got to move. And I know, I know because I hear this. I hear this in the spirit. I'm not being facetious. I do hear this. Somebody said, well, Apostle, I'm doing all I can do. Let me ask you a question. Are you really? 
Are you really? Because God would not issue a challenge if we were not maximizing where we are. See, the enemy to destiny is procrastination. Always thinking that you can do it tomorrow is the enemy to your destiny. I'm out of time. Amen. Bless you that was watching around the world. Amen. Come on, don't patty cake. Give them some praise.